Two weeks ago we came to the last episode in the story of Nehemiah and the restoration of the great city of Jerusalem. The walls had been rebuilt and the gates were back in place, but most important of all, the city was once more filled with a people worshipping the Lord God and intent on keeping his law. So much so that they made this uh, really solemn promise before God. And this wasn't just something they spoke out on the spur of the moment, in a, in a sort of moment of uh, uh, sort of feeling great about everything. This was something they thought about really, really carefully. They wrote it down uh, and they got their nobles and their leaders to sign it. In Nehemiah 10 verse 29, we read this. All these now join their fellow Israelites and nobles and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of the Lord. They'd come to realise, uh, I guess the exile had taught them, that there were consequences for not following the ways of the Lord. That to, to not follow the way of the Lord was to, to call down a curse upon yourself, really. But to follow his ways was a great, great blessing. But sadly, a hundred years later, we come to the prophet Malachi, the very last prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, and his message to the people of Israel uh, was once again a stinging rebuke to a people that had lost their way and lost their heart for the Lord. The essence of this message is that all the good promises made by the people had been undone. Their awful time in exile had taught them nothing. Their memories were just too, too short. The people of Israel were once again as rebellious as they had ever been, despite God's faithfulness and love and mercy poured out upon them and poured out upon them. But the final verse of Malachi, as many of these uh, Old Testament uh, prophecies do, comes with a message of hope, reminding the people of Israel that God hasn't finished with them yet, that he has a plan. The very, very last words of the Old Testament, Malachi 4 verses 5 and 6, the prophet declares, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. This is a prophecy that God will send another prophet that another prophet will come in his timing. And this wouldn't be the prophet Elijah brought back to life, but it will be a prophet like Elijah. This will be a really special prophet because he will be a forerunner for the, the one to come soon after him, God himself, the Messiah. And so 400 years after Malachi wrote these words down, we find an old priest serving in the temple in Jerusalem and his name is Zechariah. And Zechariah was from the, uh, the Bible tells us, from the, was from the priestly family of Abijah uh, and uh, in those days the, the, the priesthood was divided into 24 divisions uh, and for the, the big sort of festivals, the, the, um, the Feast of Tabernacles and the uh, uh, the, the Passover, all of these priestly divisions would come to Jerusalem and serve together. But for the rest of the year, each division would serve in the temple for two separate weeks. And so here we are, it's Zechariah's turn, the turn of the household, the family, uh, the division of Abijah. There were many things, many tasks to be done by these priests in the temple and around Jerusalem for the, uh, the ongoing worship of the Lord God. And many of these tasks were quite mundane and quite ordinary, but a few were incredibly special and incredibly privileged. And some of these were so special that a priest was only allowed to do them once in his whole lifetime. And it wasn't as if you kind of worked down the list so you knew when your turn would come. Each time this ceremony uh, took place, the priest to carry it out was chosen by lot. So you could go for years and years without your name uh, coming up. Or you could be a fairly new priest and suddenly there you are, your time has come. One of the rarest honours was to be chosen to enter the holy place and pour the precious uh, incense on the burning coals on the altar of incense. And this would take place uh, twice a day, once uh, during the, mo the, uh, the morning sacrifice uh, and once in the time of the evening sacrifice. 
Now this holy place wasn't the kind of place that uh, you could just go to whenever you wanted to. You couldn't just sort of show your mates around it. This was a place holy to the Lord. And just beyond the holy place lay the holy of holies, where only the high priest was allowed to go, and that just once each year. The Bible tells us that Zechariah had never been chosen to, to burn the incense in the holy place. And as he got older, presumably, he must have wondered if his time would ever come. I wonder perhaps if he'd sort of given up his name ever coming up in the, um, uh, in the lot as other younger priests came forward. Uh, and all his friends, all his compatriots, presumably had had their turn. He must have been one of the oldest priests who had yet to burn the incense. But today, today, his name is called. Zechariah, the lot has fallen to you for the incense. Come, prepare yourself. Wow, this is is his moment. Wait till he tells Elizabeth when he gets back home to the hill country that this was his time at last. He got to enter the holy place and pour out the incense on the hot coals and see it rise up to the Lord God. Uh, a picture of the prayers of the nation, the prayers of the, uh, uh, the worshippers outside in the temple courts rising up, a fragrant offering. I wonder if he was perhaps a bit nervous. Suddenly, you know, the spotlight was on him. He'd been chosen. If it had been me, I think I'd have gone a bit sort of uh, shaky, a bit worried that I might uh, do something silly like slip as I was carrying the incense into the, uh, uh, into the holy place and spill some of this precious ointment. Uh, but anyway, the time comes and Zechariah makes his way through the, the worshippers uh, who were praying fervently in the temple courts and slips through the heavy curtain to the relative quietness beyond. To his left would be the table of showbread and on his right would be the lampstand lighting up this holy, holy place. And in front of him was the glowing altar of incense, its hot coals waiting to consume the precious incense. Behind this altar then was the second curtain, beautifully embroidered, hanging motionless with the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies behind it. How amazing that he should be able to see these things that so many, the vast majority in Israel, would never, ever see. What a day. He'd never dreamed when he woke up this morning that this would be his day after all these years. At the appointed time, Zechariah pours the fragrant incense onto the coals, and the incense hisses and sizzles as it hits the hot coals and the smoke rises from the altar to the high ceiling of this holy place as the prayers in the temple courts rise to heaven. And Zechariah offers his own well-rehearsed prayer uh, before the altar. And he's about to leave when he suddenly realises he's not alone in this place. How can this be? Nobody was there when he entered, he was absolutely sure of that and he's not heard anybody following him in. But then this stranger speaks to him. Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. And then he continues describing how this son will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born and will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. Zechariah stares at this stranger. Perhaps he was expecting a different Zechariah uh, to, to be chosen to pour out the incense on this day. I mean, it's a common enough name in, in, in the priesthood. Maybe a younger man with a younger wife. Yes, of course, they prayed for a child, but that was years ago when it was biologically possible for Elizabeth to conceive. But her womb had been closed, and now she was well beyond the, the, uh, the age to bear a child. And so Zechariah replies, not wanting to offend this stranger, but feeling the need perhaps to point out politely the potential flaw in this plan. How can I be sure of this, he says. I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The stranger gazes at him and responds with quiet authority. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. Gabriel, the angel of God. 
Wasn't this the angel that had visited Daniel and explained to him the prophecies uh, and the dreams and the visions that God had given to him? He was looking at a being that had come from the very presence of the Lord God. The stranger continued, And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at the appointed time. Zechariah tries to speak a word of apology for not believing, but, but no words would come. And he suddenly realises it's gone very quiet in the temple courts outside. The prayers are waiting for him to come out and pro proclaim over them the blessing of Aaron. This blessing, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. But dear Zechariah had something so much more exciting to, 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 to speak out, to declare to the people today, if only he could speak. The angel, this Gabriel, had told him that he and Elizabeth were going to have a son, that his name was to be called John, meaning God is gracious. He would go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. Echoes here of those beautiful last two verses in Malachi. Could his son, could Zechariah's son, be the prophet who would herald the coming of the Messiah? God had indeed heard their prayers of years before. He was answering it his way, in his timing, and giving them so much more than they could ever have hoped for. Did Zechariah needed to get back to Elizabeth, his dear wife now, and tell her, somehow communicate to her, this amazing good news. What an amazing story. What a day for Zechariah. What a day for humankind. The wheels had begun to turn. Uh, the Messiah was on his way. The Lord God was coming to save his people. There are two things I love about this story. The first is that God heard the prayer of Zechariah and Elizabeth. The feeling I get from this story is that Zechariah, uh, from sort of Zechariah's response to what the angel said, was that uh, he and Elizabeth uh, had probably stopped praying that prayer years before. It wasn't as if this was a current prayer, that when the angel came along and said, I've heard your prayers, oh great, let's go for it. This was a prayer from maybe years, years before. Maybe, doubtless, something that they had prayed earnestly about in the past, when it might have seemed possible that Elizabeth would conceive. But those days had long gone, and with them the prayers had become fainter and less hopeful, uh, until they'd, they'd probably just completely stopped altogether, until it was now more a kind of a thing of regret, uh, or perhaps a vain, vain wish. But God had heard their prayer. It gives me hope, this, uh, these words, God has heard your prayer for the many things that we have prayed for and have yet to see come to fruition. God hears all our prayers. They matter to him. Prayer is so much a part of this story because at the heart of it is this altar of incense, symbolic of the prayers of the people of God. I love this picture of the incense hissing and sizzling on the hot coals and then rising as a beautiful aroma to heaven. To me this is like the prayers of God's people uh, facing the heat of challenge and trials and temptations and bringing our needs and our desires uh, to God. And these prayers kind of hitting the hot coals of challenge and trial and need and rising like a beautiful fragrance to God. There was a very special um, recipe, formula, for this incense that was used in the temple worship uh, in, the, in the holy place. And in a sense there is a very particular, wonderful recipe for our prayers, our incense, if you like, modelled on the beautiful prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. It begins, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. A prayer that we're, many of us are so very familiar with and a model of praying, really, that we can learn from it. But I also love, you know, quite apart from this, this thing of the general prayers, if you like, the prayers for a nation, 
going up to God. I love that Gabriel encourages Zechariah that his prayer has been heard. His little personal prayer, not just these big sort of prayers for a nation and for a people. Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth laying before God the desperate the desire that they both had to have a child. God hears our prayer. God hears your prayers and my prayers. He hears our big prayers and our little prayers. And we can entrust all of our prayers to our loving Father and to Jesus who has proven his love to us beyond any shadow of a doubt by going to the cross and dying for us. Secondly, I love that God was uh, that uses, God uses ordinary flawed people for his purposes. People that don't always say the right things, people that don't always do uh, exactly the things that they should be doing in response to, to, to God. He uses people who believe, but he also uses those of us that want to believe, but sometimes struggle to believe, that want to fully trust but sometimes find ourselves fretting and worrying, that want to rest in hope, but find ourselves busy and distracted. Jesus has promised that he will build his church, and he will do so out of ordinary, flawed people that don't always get things right, like you and me. He will help us as we offer ourselves to him day by day, week by week, as we commit and recommit our way to him. He will help us to pray. Lord God, thank you for Zechariah. Thank you that you heard his prayer. Thank you that you hear our prayers. Thank you for Zechariah not fully believing, flawed and failing, but nevertheless used by you. Amen. <laughs>